Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy, coming at you on the 19th of May 2024. And um, I want to call this episode King Baphomet, Demons and Other Freaks, right? Because it's been one of those uh, interesting times recently. There's a lot of stuff I haven't spoken about um, as well, which I do want to get into. But of course, the most interesting thing that has happened is old King Sausage Fingers, old Charlie Boy, has um, had some man called Jonathan Yo paint his official portrait. And um, I don't know about you, but I, I, I bloody hate it. I think it's an abomination. It is so horribly ugly and it's full of all this red paint. Um, and uh, well, I'm gonna uh, start by showing it to you. So um, here is King Sausage Fingers official portrait. Now, there's nothing doctored about this. I, I just put in King Charles portrait into um, the search bar to get an official image. And then what I decided to do was reflect it four times and create four quarters. So um, if you zoom out, then you can see. Now, if you look in the middle, you can see some subliminal stuff. It looks like simulacrums created by, um, yeah, by reflections. However, if you uh, accentuate that stuff and sort of make Charlie look a little bit less significant there, um, this looks like a sort of totem pole of demonic forces, doesn't it? I mean, you can see Baphomet at the top. Just below the halfway line, you can see um, a bear's head. And at the bottom, it looks like there's ovaries and um, a lady garden, doesn't there? And there's a few other sort of simulacrums in there as well. And, uh, you know, I've noticed this go all around, but uh, you could argue, yeah, that it's just simulacrums, it's just reflections, this is all a coincidence. And I would believe that up to a point, but the fact is that, you know, it's dominated by Baphomet at the top, and this is just something that's so commonly associated with these elites. It does kind of make you wonder whether or not the painter had actually come up with an idea like this in the first place, generated it on a computer, and then thought, right, well, how can I hand paint this quarter of the image in the, uh, you know, so in the uh, bottom right-hand corner of the painting and just make it look like a normal painting? But then you do that and that's what they see, that's what you get. And um, it does honestly make me wonder what the hell is going on. Are they invoking demons? Is all this stuff about black magic real? I mean, it most certainly does make you wonder. It makes me wonder most certainly. And at the same time, you know, this is happening. We're seeing all sorts of other weird freakery going around, which of course I do want to get into um, in this episode as well. However, I like to perform myself a little bit of satire and this is a piece of satire which involves what I consider to be uh, my own white magic spell. It's kind of like um, when you get uh, the forces of two of your adversaries and you use satire to turn them against each other. And I thought, why not get the um, Just Stop Oil lot and instead of getting them to throw red tomato soup over, uh, over Van Gogh, why not get them to throw pea soup at Charlie Boy? So I hope you enjoy this. Security. Yeah, I put that up on Facebook, got quite a lot of views and a lot of people actually appreciated that, so that's good. Now that's what you gotta do, isn't you? Um, and luckily enough, um, my cheap, not quite up to Final Cut Pro um, video editor um, does have some AI where it can kind of cut people out from their backgrounds, although it's not very good, but it still does the job, eh? And the green slime, well, I wanted it to look a bit cartoonish. That was the whole idea. I didn't want it to look, um, you know, I always think that, you know, if you put something, make it something look a little bit cheap and almost like Monty Python animation in there, it does add to the, it does add to the humour. So, yep, yeah, I most certainly hope you enjoyed that. So, at the same time this is happening, um, a couple of other things have happened this year which do make me wonder. The Eurovision is one of them. Now, of course, I don't really pay much attention to any of this stuff anymore. Um, and being the old fart that I am, I remember what the Eurovision was back in the day. In the 1960s, 1970s, of course, I don't remember the 1960s as I wasn't born, but I do remember it in the 1970s and uh, early 80s, I suppose, as well, when it was just a kind of family show with a lot of um, different countries in Europe, uh, you know, uh, was it contenders from one European country each, all getting together and just making what you would call safe for granny music. It wasn't particularly rock and roll. 
But it was, say for instance, if there was anyone on the continent, and um, as Britain and America dominated music in those days, it did open up as a gateway for people from the continent to be able to, to um, get their way into the British music industry, and from then they could actually then work on comp conquering America. And so this was good for ABBA. ABBA, um, you know, won with Waterloo. And of course, you know, um, I still remember a few other things like that. German Nicole, who'd done the song A Little Piece. It was just basically a very um, twee song. Like um, Johnny Logan, who won What's Another Year for Ireland. Another very twee, very um, safe for granny song, as well as um, Bucks Fizz, Making Your Mind Up. Um, launched their career and they did go on to have a career in the UK and of course you know things like that so uh, only you go back further in time and you've got artists like was it Cliff Richards and Congratulations terribly cheesy song but you know whatever um, it got remembered for a while Sandy Shaw puppet on a string and you know it was just a very twee safe for granny music show that musical snobs and rock and roller types like myself used to take the piss out of we think it must be the worst song that wins you know and um, it was just a sort of bit of a joke really because it wasn't really the it wasn't really the most cool thing that you would find but if you were in the UK and you were watching it you'd be soothed by the dulcet tones of Terry Wogan um, you know narrating it and that sort of thing and um, it just it was kind of like a good European institution and I haven't seen it for a very long time and now it's full of freaks I mean you know weird demonic dress up cosplay um, they call them, a lot of these people are calling themselves non-binary and queer, which basically means that they are probably heterosexual, right? And they're probably normal, but they are cosplaying their way into the space of marginalised groups because it's the only way that they can grift themselves to the top in all of this, right? And um, there's one character who goes by the name of, um, what's he call herself? Bambi Thug from Ireland. I feel my ancestors turning in their graves already. Um, this is a picture of her and her boyfriend. Um, and this is the bit, of course, at the when you know uh, where she said that you know why I'm special is because I'm a queer and I'm a witch, which she shouted out like you know in a shriek. Um, but yeah, so this is her and her boyfriend. She's a heterosexual woman, right? who has identifies as a non-binary queer, because, well, that's how you make it these days, isn't it? She's also a pro-Palestinian activist as well. And um, I don't know, I just think I keep away from it. I mean, I've not really watched it. I haven't watched hardly any of it. But so all I hear people saying is that they just seem to be um, doing kind of satanic rituals and invoking demonic stuff. And um, we are treated to quite a bit of this. So... Um, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, all I know is here, where I am, in the East, there isn't much of that. There really isn't. And it most certainly has not, um, how can I say, metastasized its way through the culture like a cancer here in the East. And um, this is just another reason why I say, well, if you know what's good for you, get out of the West. If you are staying in the West, then you've got a fight on your hands. But it really needs people to be brave at this point. I mean, I'm not talking stunning and brave. No, I'm talking, you know, I mean, you know, uh, I'm talking brave in the old fashioned way that we used to talk about it. You know, back in the day um, when uh, men were real men and women were real women, that sort of thing. You have to be brave to stand up to all of what is going on at the moment. And then, of course, um, my YouTube feed keeps on coming up with critiques of the new Doctor Who. And uh, yeah. I, all I know, right, I'm not going to go too much into this, but one of the things that I have noticed is that um, they are only talking about, and, and Russell T Davies, the, um, I would say, the, the showrunner of Doctor Who, came back after a few years, has now decided that because he was a pioneer back in 1999, he was the creator of the programme Queer as Folk, that therefore everything about all of the, you know, everything, because it's just all about race, all about gender, all about this, you know, with just uh, the, the message, as they call it, that narrative shoved down your throat, whether you would like it or not, and much, not much in the line of story. And it's certainly not the same programme that it used to be. And of course, it's Disneyfied these days as well. And um, their attitude is that any of the old Doctor Who fans, um, which pretty much makes up three quarters of all the people who watch it or more, don't like the new direction, you can just piss off, you bigots, you racists, you sexists, you this istophobes and all of that. And, um, well, I think that 
I can't agree with him on that. I think um, everyone who did like Doctor Who should do that. And we should step back and wait for them to get the new audience. That they think they're going to get three per people to every one person who ain't going to watch it. Well, we just uh, we just not watch it. We don't have anything to do with it anymore. And um, it can die the slow death because now that it's in the hands of Disney, who are a private company who have to make a profit for their shareholders, um, they are the ones who have got the streaming license for it now. It's not, and they're putting a lot more money into the special effects than, say, um, the BBC would have done. Um, they're going to find that they're not going to find this to be a very viable business option after a couple more um, seasons of this, and I think it's just going to have to die. And I honestly think the best thing that, we, that could happen to Doctor Who is it just dies and goes off air for another 15 years. I really do. Um, because at the moment, this is what seems to be happening, is that literally everything that I grew up with from when I was a kid Anything related to our culture, anything related to our, um, you know, to music, to art, to TV, to films, everything is being hijacked by this hideously freakish, metastasizing, cancerous, woke mind virus, which has gone so badly out of control. Now, look, no one would have any problems with people coming up with original TV programs, right? Original TV programs that are designed to represent people that otherwise wouldn't be represented. No one would have any issues with that. It's like, um, if you were to go back far enough, Michael Caine, right, my day, it's Michael Caine. Oh, no, I know that. Michael Caine said that when he was growing up um, in the 50s, um, one of the things that he remembered was that working class people were not represented in a true way on any British television thing because right back in those days they all spoke posh and um, whenever they had um, cockneys they were usually played by posh people and they were usually grovelling caricatures and he said that in real life the working classes um, didn't grovel to anyone, didn't behave like the way they were made out to be by these posh people imitating cockneys um, back in the day and so when he um, got into uh, making movies uh, and the 60s happened he was happy that he could uh, represent real people in England and it wasn't that they wanted to represent marginalised minorities, no, they just wanted to represent what people are like, really are like in um, the UK, say for instance, but to not, not be condescended to by this elite class of BBC English speaking snobs. And so that was a good direction to go in. And this, what we're in at the moment, all these people who are going about how marginalised they are, wanting to be represented in this kind of way, um, are doing a disingenuous and false version of that. You see, if they wanted to come up with anything original, you know, like go back to the, I'll give you an example, you go back to the 1980s, 1990s, something like that, there was a comedy programme called um, Desmond's, and it was about um, a, uh, it was based in a barber shop. All the characters in it were black, they were all sort of, I think it was based in South London, and it was like a uh, sort of uh, Caribbean black, family and friends who were main characters. Now, people liked Desmond's because it was funny, it was a good program. Um, and uh, it was pretty much representative of a black minority in the UK, or at least in London, and no one had any problem with it. You know, people didn't say, oh no, they're not just doing that. It wasn't about just um, doing something about, um, you know, uh, an ethnic minority race just for the hell of doing it, just to tick diversity boxes. It was, uh, it was just done, it was a good programme, it worked. And, um, you know, anyone could have watched it and um, pretty much anyone could have related to it. Now, people out in the more white rural parts of the UK might not have done, but if you, were, if you grew up in London as I did, you would be able to relate to it because they reminded you of people that you would have known and no one had any issue with that. And all that these present people that we have at the moment who claim to be all these marginalised minorities, all they have to do is come up with original content that's good, that's watchable. You know, that's uh, funny if it's a comedy, that's, um, you know, gripping if it's a drama, and intelligent and pioneering, that's all they have to do. And no one would have a problem with that, because it would come across as genuine and real. Uh, but the trouble is, since um, the, uh, what to say, the metropolitan elite caught the, uh, the Islington variant, as I like to call it, right, what's happened is now that they have got into this point where they live in a very, very small bubble, a very, very small echo chamber. They don't know they do, and they are externalising that and projecting that very harshly in a very judgmental way onto everyone else. The majority of their normal people, and I don't mean normies, 
I want to say the difference between normies and normal people. Although I've never been mainstream and I've been a bit of a freak um, in my younger years, back when the counterculture was a little bit more credible than it is now, and um, it was uh, a real counterculture back then, what's happened now is that a bunch of um, crazy, autistic, um, dysphoric, strange, not very well socialised, um, narcissistic people of varying degrees have taken over the entire mainstream edifice and the entire mainstream narrative. And um, because we're in this time of narrow cast now, which is what I like to call it, the post-internet, um, you know, television pop culture machine, they think that they are the majority, they think they are speaking for the majority, or maybe they don't. Maybe they really are a bunch of totalitarian, malevolent, Machiavellian social engineers who want to tell you how you're going to be, and if you don't conform to that, well, you're cancelled. But there's a lot of that at the moment. And um, the trouble is, of course, is that even still to this day, most, what I say, um, people who are just like normal people, and God, I suppose I must even kind of reluctantly include myself into that as well, are not like this. And if you were to go around um, the UK, if you were to go around anywhere in any street or whatever, and you were to just see normal people from day to day, they would not all be trans, they would not all be flamboyantly camp, um, they would not be any of these things that are depicted on the Eurovision or on modern day Doctor Who now. No, they would not look like that at all. They would still look like people. It's only when you get to, um, I don't know, gentrified areas of inner cities or, you know, I don't know, places like Bristol or Brighton or maybe if you go to, um, what was it, college campuses, then you would see that. But the media thinks that this is the majority or acts like it's the majority of people. So, but they also think they're the counterculture. They're not. They're the establishment class. The real counterculture now, of course, is the people who've just completely tuned out of the mainstream, the people who live in rural villages, or, or like people like myself who can't even be asked to stay on that fucking island and are so sick of the Western world and all this bullshit, don't have anything to fucking do with it. Right? These are the people who are, you know, kind of like your more normal and more everyday people who um, are not represented anymore. Um, and the people who think they are the counterculture because they um, dress up in very weird clothes are no longer countercultural. They are now the establishment. It's a complete um, inversion of reality. I think there's a word for it out here, actually, um, in, uh, in, uh, was it? In, in the Philippines. Uh, baliktad translates as inverted, you know, and that's it. I look at it and I call it baliktad world now. You know, the Western world is baliktad world. And um, no, I, uh, I, you know, I just wonder how long can they keep milking this for? Because um, the only thing that can actually happen is, right? Now, of course, what happens is that um, if, say, for instance, I was to put the hashtag RIP Doctor Who on this video, which I don't plan to do, of course, right? Um, I don't plan to do that at all. But if I did, I would just get bots, um, you know, um, uh, replying to me and they would automatically tell me what a racist, sexist, bigot I am, what a, uh, they would refer to me and call me a conservative. They wouldn't even have watched this video. They wouldn't see this long-haired, hippie-looking character who's not typical of a normie-looking person. They wouldn't have um, taken any of this into consideration. And I'd just get generic paragraphs of generic cliches down. I mean, it actually happened to me once before. I ended up deleting it because I thought, oh, fuck this, I just can't be asked with it, right? But that's exactly what would happen if I was to put that hashtag and attach it to this video. Or if I, I don't know if there's a kind of anti-Eurovision meme that you could put on there as well, but I'd probably get attacked by them too. And then before you know it, I'd get all the crazy, what is it, um, foaming at the mouth, pro-Palestine and possibly pro-Hamas lot, um, getting really hateful with me in the comments too. And they're this, very, this group of people who are filled with hate and resentment are the people who are then projecting outwards, but anyone who doesn't agree with them, they're the haters, and they want to have legislation in place to stop that type of hate. But, of course, it's a two-tiered system, right? So the only thing I think we can do is, the more we see this grotesque freakery polluting our world, the more, really, I suppose, the ultimate thing to do is ignore it. Don't hate-watch it. Right, I mean, I'm, I'm, 
I'm getting a lot of things, especially about, you know, from the Eurovision and especially from Doctor Who, coming up on my feed for people who've hate watched, what hate watched all this stuff, just to comment on it. Um, and um, I'm not watching this stuff anymore. I'm kind of like, it's second hand for me. I'm hearing what people are saying. And um, the conclusion I come to is that the only thing we can do is give it all a wide berth, ignore it all, um, maybe, you know, make our own culture, look for other things outside of all of that, and let it bore itself out of existence because that's exactly what will happen to it in the end. Um, you know, this is the thing. Oh, incidentally, before I go, uh, one of the things that made me laugh was the Metro newspaper in, uh, in London, and you may know it, the Londoners will know it. it. I remember it goes right the way back to the 1990s when they started giving out the free Metro paper. It started out as a kind of like a free alternative to the evening standard. Um, the whole idea of it is that, you know, they're everywhere. They're even left behind for other people to read. So you end up picking it up and then the mainstream narrative is getting your head. Nothing really is for free, is it? Anyway, Metro, um, what they done was that they, um, they'd done an article where there was a headline saying, I'm sorry, straight white men, Doctor Who isn't for you, or whatever. Uh, I can't remember the exact word, I'm paraphrasing. And they got so much backlash from people on Twitter, they ended up deleting their entire account. I think it's back on there now, but I thought that was quite funny, you know. So um, they don't know how to read the room, these people. They don't know how to, um, you know, they are not with us. Um, they are not with the general consensus of your ordinary person. They live in a complete other world and they just keep on repeating propaganda relentlessly time and time again, saying that it's everyone else, not them, that's to blame these istophobe bigot types that are out there. And it's not us. We're not the ones living in an echo chamber, they say. It's all the rest of you. We three or four socially autistic, awkward, resent-filled freaks with mental problems are perfectly sane. It's all you normal and sane people out there that are bigots is basically their message. Now, the more and more people grasp this, the more, um, I suppose, just people can marginalise them even more. They can just all find each other and the rest of us can just ignore them. They can all find each other, they can all live together and um, we can just switch them off. I think that's the best thing to do. And then when they don't have our attention anymore and they have to all hang out with each other in their own little bubble and there's nothing left but them, then they can all turn on each other. That'd be fun to watch, wouldn't it? <laughs> right. Anyway, I shall leave it at that. Um, I'm probably not going to do a video for at least another week now. Um, so, uh, to you then, I suppose. Till then, see you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.